and I told our team that was here early this morning uh, that I felt like I was in a Winnie the Pooh uh, story. It was a blustery day. <laughs> How many, how many of you guys felt like that this morning? Was it hard getting out? Come on. Was it hard getting out of bed this morning after Christmas and Christmas hangover and all that? I know for me it was, and then it being cold outside. So we're really glad that you got up and came this morning uh, here to Renovate Church. So uh, what I want to talk about this morning is uh, we're just going to cast a little bit of vision uh, for where we want to go in 2019 as a church. Um, The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, that without vision, people perish and they cast off restraint. And so it's really important uh, that we have vision as a church for where we want to go and who we want to be and what we want to do, but it's also important that we have individual personal vision that each of us needs vision uh, for our life. Because the scripture says if we don't, uh, we end up casting off restraint. We end up, uh, we end up wandering. And so we're going to talk about vision this morning. Um, we're going to be in primarily two passages of scripture. We're going to be in a passage of scripture in Acts 19 that's going to be more corporate in nature. And then we're going to be in Colossians 1, and uh, look at some very powerful things that Paul says there to uh, the church at Coloss. Um, Our vision here at Renovate uh, is to establish a transforming movement of God in and through the people of Austin that impacts the world for Jesus Christ. Now, five years ago, when we were sitting in Indianapolis dreaming about coming and planting this church, Renovate Church, uh, people will always challenge you to, hey, you need to have a vision statement. You need to have a mission statement. You need to have core values that that are going to help define who you are as a community. And it sounds really easy, right? Like, Vision statement, sure. And so uh, I was going through a book at that time uh, called Church Unique. And it was written by a guy named Will Mancini. And he says early on in the book that one of the greatest challenges and one of the greatest um, um, challenges setbacks that he would say to the church is that so many times in the church we try to copy somebody else he 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 said you know so many churches today they'll look and they'll say um oh rick warren is got this incredible way of doing church i'm gonna go out and see his model and everything that he does and then we're just gonna come and we're just gonna transplant it right here to our community and our body. Now, there's things that we can learn from pastors that lead well, from churches that break through in their community and their context, but it is not the right thing to do to just borrow models and borrow systems from somebody else and just say, hey, this, and Will Mancini said this, he said, he said, every time God forms a church, he forms it uniquely, uniquely. He said, there's no two snowflakes that are alike. There's no two sunsets that are exactly alike. And there's no two churches that are exactly alike. And so I was going through this book, Church Unique, and I must have wrote our vision statement out 200 times. Because they'll tell you, really, you should be able to express what you're about in 10 to 12, maybe 15 words. And I'm like, whoa, each of these words are really important because they really should mean something. Because what you say then prohibits you from what you don't say. And so I would sit there and I would write out the vision 
And, and I would show it to April, and she was like, ah, oh, that's terrible. And uh, I'm like, no, 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 you know, and I do it, start, so da, 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 da. Now listen, the words that we chose to use in this vision statement all mean something to us. To establish a transforming, because what we're about here at the end of the day is about seeing lives transformed. We really believe that the gospel has the ability and the capacity to transform lives. Our lives, April and our lives, were transformed by the gospel, by who Jesus is, that he, that he loves us, uh, that he forgives us, that he has a hope and a future for us. We really believe at the center that, that, that the gospel has the, the ability to transform lives. And if we didn't, then all that we're doing here is we're no better than the Optimist Club. We're just gathering, we're having some fun activities, you know, maybe a pep rally. But at the, at the, at the heart of what it's about is, is transformation. That we can be transformed, that we can be changed. And then we chose the word movement because we never wanted to just come and plant a church that was primarily focused on what was going on on the inside. Because it's really easy as a church, it's really easy to have your holy huddle, right? To just come in and say, hey, we got our, you know, our, 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 our people here and, and we don't want to have to deal with the world out there and we're just going to, we're going to focus on what's going on inside of here. And yet God says, hey, scripturally, the church is the church gathered, but then the church is the church scattered. In the book of Acts, it was always the church gathered and the church scattered. The church on the, on move, on the move, on mission, where we live, work, and play, and to the ends of the earth. So we chose that word very carefully because, because we don't just want to be a church that's primarily concerned about being internally focused. Internally focused is important, but it's not the only thing. And now the biggest thing. So it's to establish a transforming movement of God in and through the people of Austin. We chose that really, really specifically. Because see, in my years of being in ministry, I've been in ministry now. I went into full-time ministry in 1995. I've been in ministry for 23 years. And I have seen there's, that there's essentially two ways that you can do leadership, church, or ministry. There's two ways. The way number one, people are a means to an end. People are a means to an end. How does that work? It works like this. I have a vision. Dave has a vision. Dave and Chad and Tammy have a vision. And we need people to serve my vision. There's churches that function like that. That, that really, hey, hey, we got this vision and we want to see these things happen and we want to get a building and we want to do this and we want to do this and we need people to serve and support and fund our vision. And in that kind of context, people are disposable. They're disposable. But then there's a second way where people are the vision. Where, 
where people are the end. See, I had this revelation after being on staff at our church in Indianapolis at Traders Point. I was on staff for about nine months. And I kept coming home, and I kept telling April, there's something different about th this church. There's something different about th the DNA. And I can't put my finger on it. And one day, our head elder, Gene Harker, asked me. He was the chairman of the board of Lincoln Christian University, and he was driving over, and he said, hey, man, um, they want you to come do a basketball clinic over at Lincoln. And I got some stuff to do as well. Hey, do you want to drive over with me and do this? And I said, man, I would love to. We got in the car to drive the three or four hours over. And Gene Harker, he's got four doctorates. He's four doctorates. He's brilliant, but he's one of the most humble, empowering people. His, his life's mission statement is that true leadership causes other people to flourish. And we were driving in the car, and I was asking Gene, I said, Gene, what's the vision of the church, man? What's the vision? I want to hear the vision, man, the lofty vision. And he looked at me, and he said, Dave, the vision of the church is really simple. We believe that every single person that walks through our doors is a treasure and God has put treasures in them, and we exist to simply create environments where they can do and be everything Christ has called them to do and be. And I came home, and I told April, I got it. We had been living in a ministry paradigm where we had a vision, and people needed to to come and support that vision, serve that vision. And I said, man, this is different. It's, it's, it's upside down. It's, it's upside down. And I remember thinking, wow, like that is so much more powerful to release the calling and the destiny and the purpose inside of people than just to have them serve in a disposable way, your own personal vision. We chose those words really carefully to establish a transforming movement of God in and through the people of Austin because we truly believe that there's calling and purpose and ministry and destiny in people, in people. It was, it was, Christ's way. Jesus came and he was the rock star. I mean, Jesus is like moving and grooving, walking on water, like, you know, feeding 5,000 with a Luby's card. I mean, he's, he's, he's the rock star. And then he says, but like, hey, it's better if I go away. And I'm going to put my kingdom and my power and my purposes inside of each one of you. And you're going to carry ministry and purpose and calling and destiny into all the spheres where you're at. See, Jesus could have just stayed in the one mansion. No, 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 no. Man, he multiplied. He empowered people. It was Jesus' way. So in short, people are our vision. You're our vision. Now, how does that play out? How does that play out? I'm going to move around here really quickly. Uh, I had my order of slides in a different order. But I want, if you have your Bible, turn to Colossians 1. And we're going to look at uh, quite a bit of scripture in Colossians 1. And we're going to see how, how Paul communicated this. So Colossians 1, 
verses, uh, it's slide uh, 9. Colossians 1, 1 through 3. So Paul's writing to the church at Coloss. Here's what he says. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Coloss, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God the Father, God our Father. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. One of the things I want you to notice in this passage of Scripture is how many times he uses the word you and your. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Watch where he goes with it. Because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continue to ask God to fill you with all the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. And watch how he ends. He spends the next 11 or 12 verses talking about the supremacy of Christ and who he is. And then here's how he ends this chapter. Excuse me. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Paul says, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. He was others focused. Others focused. Philip in my flesh would have still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. And I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations. This mystery. What is this mystery? He's going to tell us. It's, it's this mystery. What is God doing? What's, what's his activity in the earth? It's been kept hidden for ages and generations, but it's now disclosed to the Lord's people, to them. God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is God's hope of glory at Vandegrift High School? Christ in you. What is God's hope of glory in, in Grand Mesa? Christ in in you. What is his hope for glory at Canyon Ridge Middle School or Four Points Middle School? Christ in you. What is his hope for glory at Vista Ridge? Christ in you. What is his hope of glory at Reed Elementary? 
Christ in you. What is his hope for glory at McNeil High School? Christ in you. What is his hope for Cedar Park in Leander? Christ in you. Christ in you. It's Christ in us. Now look at what Paul goes on to say. And he ends the chapter and he says this. He, Jesus, is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend or labor with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. What is Paul saying here? Paul is saying a few things. One of those things that he is communicating is the primary focus of his ministry was equipping and serving and empowering people to do and be what Christ has called them to do and be. And in doing so, the mission will advance and God will be glorified. That's our passion here at Renovate. Now listen, and I know that I'm going to say this and it's going to sound a little bit counterintuitive. But I'm not, I am not primarily concerned with the size of our church. Because I've seen churches of a hundred people that have an incredible impact on their community and the world. I'm not primarily concerned. Do I want to grow? Absolutely, because people, numbers represent people and callings and purpose and destiny and ministry. But I'm not primarily concerned with the size of our church. What I'm primarily concerned with is are the people in our church growing? Growing. Growing in what? I'm just going to give you a couple things. Number one, this is our hope for you in 2019. That number one, that you'll grow in Christ likeness. That you'll grow in your character. It's our passion. We want to see, see you looking more and more like Jesus. Second thing, we want you to grow in your knowledge of God and his word. We want you to, to, to grow in it. That's what Paul is, is communicating. He's like, he's pouring out his heart. It's like, hey, I'm wanting you to know Christ and the power is right. I'm wanting you to, to know what he's done for you and who he is. And so we're wanting you to grow in your knowledge of God and his word. We're wanting you to grow in understanding the unique call and purpose that you have on your life. Because every single person here, you have a purpose and you have a call and you have a destiny and you have a ministry that only you can do. Only you can do. I can't do that ministry. So we want to see you grow in that. We want to see our church grow in, in love. 
love for one another, love for our community, love for those who aren't like us, love for those who are hard to love. We want to see our church grow in that. But at the end of the day, one of the things that we really believe here at Renovate is that I believe that this church, what, what will mark this church is a couple things. One is leadership will mark this church. That God, I really believe that he's drawing leaders here to renovate. Uh, and leaders who are going to be part of the body, leaders who are going to be equipped and empowered in the ministry things that you develop are going to be impactful. Because again, it's, it's, it's what can, how can we empower people? How can we empower you? So leadership will mark this church. Second thing that will mark this church is influence. Influence. That, that I really believe that God has called us, even as a small church, that we're going to have influence in different spheres of this city. Real quick, turn to Acts 19, and then we'll wrap it up. Just going to read super quick through this. It says, while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples, and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in, in Christ Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. They spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. And Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Let me just tell you a quick thing. Paul is in a place called Ephesus, and Ephesus was one of the most important cities in uh, the world at that time. It was a city of incredible culture, incredible commerce, uh, incredible influence, but it also had its good and its bad. It, ha it was very spiritual, but not necessarily Christian, and it was actually very pagan. And Paul comes into this city, Ephesus, and he finds a small group of people, 12 in all, that he pours his life into for the next couple years. And Ephesus becomes the leading missionary sending center of the world at its time. What starts here with this little, what we're reading here, what starts here ended up impacting and influencing the region and the world. Watch this. There were about 12 men in all. Seems really insignificant. Paul entered the synagogue, spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. Some people were like, yeah, yeah, we're not, we're not buying this stuff, Paul. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard 
the word of the Lord. Pick this up. Go back with me to Acts 19, 5 through 8. Twelve people. Paul, where did he start? The church, the synagogue. He started there. But where did he, where did he move to? Tyrannus is a picture of he moved to the marketplace. Come on. He moved to the market. He was in the synagogue for three months preaching. They were like, yeah, no, hey, not interested. Paul says, hey, okay, now I'm going to go out where the people are. I'm going to go to the businesses. I'm going to go to schools. I'm going to go to teams. I'm going to go to the music world. And, and that's what Paul did. And in the book of Acts, 37 out of 39 miracles that take place in the book of Acts took place not in the church, in the marketplace. If you read on later, it goes on to say that extraordinary miracles were happening through the hands of Paul, that even his handkerchiefs, they would take that, right? And we get caught up and go like, oh, is this kind of like what we see on TV where like, hey, order this prayer cloth and put it on your kid and he'll get healed and da-da-da-da-da. No, what it's more representative of is Paul was working in the marketplace and he would take off his apron and think, and, and it's, it's, it's more representative of that than it is of some crazy scheme that you see on TV where you send in your $100 and they'll send you their anointed prayer na napkin. But, but that's the point. Now watch. Twelve men, Paul starts in the, the synagogue for three months, but where he ends up, on hearing this, they were baptized, excuse me, they became obstinate, they refused to believe, publicly in the way, so Paul left, he took the disciples with him. What was he doing? What was he doing for two years? Equipping, training. Look, this is my big call to action for you for 2019 is get equipped. Get trained. Be intentional with it. I was with Willie Friday night. We we're sitting up talking at his house till 2.30 in the morning. And we, were, and we were talking, and, and I was just talking, and, and I'm going to be very general with what I say here because I don't want to come across odd. <laughs> but I was just saying, like, you know, I was having a conversation with one of my children, and they said, hey, Dad, the only reason you got everything you got is because you just happened to get this crazy skill where you could put a basketball into a basket. And I said, well, that's quite offensive. <laughs> it wasn't Brett. I said, no, 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 bro. Like, I had to work really hard. So Willie and I were talking about kid, kid stuff. And I was like, have you please said that to me, dude? And he's like, yeah, I believe it. <laughs> and he was like, you know what, though? You did work really hard. But you know what? When you went into ministry, you, you worked hard at putting yourself in environments where you could be discipled and equipped and trained. That's why I moved over here from Houston the very first time we moved is because I was like, hey, I need to be in a place where I can be equipped and trained and released into the calling that God has on my life. But we have to be intentional with it. You have to be, look. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him. And had discussions daily in the lecture hall. Daily. They were making that. Do you think these people worked? 
Yes, but they were available. They were available. This went on for two years. For two years, Paul was pouring into them, equipping them, training them, empowering them to ultimately, what? Release them. This little group of 12, and Mark will maybe correct me if I'm wrong here, but this little group of 12, this, this Ephesus, in time became a church of a quarter million. Is that right? I know, I put you in a really bad position. Yeah. Influence. Influence. Why? What does it say? They were available. This went on for two years so that, now watch, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. He didn't just say all the people who lived in Reagan's Overlook. Dude, he says who lived in the province of Asia. That's a, that's a big spot. Heard the word of the Lord. How did they hear the word of the Lord? Through the people that Paul poured himself. Leadership will mark this church. Influence will mark this church. And creativity is going to mark this church. Creativity. Creative ways of, of reaching people and doing things. There's creativity in this house. I'll end with this. Five years ago, I was in Europe. I was at the European Leadership Forum, and uh, they had this incredible, I think I was the least smart guy in the, there's a thousand people, it's invite only, you have to be like some world-class, like one guy I was talking to, I said, oh, what do you do? He says, oh, I, leave, I lead the uh, Baptist denomination for all of Poland. I oversee 1,127 churches. I said, Wow. He's like, what do you do? I'm an outreach pastor. <laughs> I pastor a church of 100 in Austin. <laughs> I honestly think I was the least smart guy. I mean, Wayne Grudem was there and Oz Guinness and all these giants, right? So I'm going through this bookstore, and one particular book caught my eye, and it's called the, I think it was called the uh, Eight Personalities of a Church. I was like, what? And I opened it up, and I was like, wow, this is powerful that churches can have personalities, just like people have personalities. And I read through all of them, and the one that really stood out to me, I said, man, this is the kind of church we always end up planting and being part of. It's entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial. Because, guys, in time, the types of ministries that come out of this house are going to reach hundreds and thousands of people. There's ministry in Manny. There's ministry in Kim. There's ministry in Stephen and Christine. There's ministry in Lori and Jennifer. Tammy's got books in her. There's ministry. There's ministry in Sam. There's ministry in Adam and David. There's ministry in Tammy. There's ministry in Mike. There's ministry in Lord. There's ministry in church. There's ministry in Mark. There's ministry in Tasha and Alan. There's creativity. It's what's going to mark leadership, influence, and creativity. Here's the thing I'm asking of you as we come into this next year. Will you be intentional? Will you be available? Because our heart is what we read in Colossians 1. I and April and our team, man, what, that's what, man, I, I want to pour out and empower and invest and equip and train you for the call that you have on your life. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for just the privilege it is to serve you. Lord, to know you, to walk with you, the privilege it is to serve this uh, body of people. I thank you for every single person here. God, I pray that you would just stir something in it. God, the hope of glory is Christ in them. It's Christ in them that's the hope of glory to their family. It's Christ in them that's the hope of glory to their neighbors and their co-workers and their fellow students and their teammates. And God, let them, let them see that. Let them, God, get excited. I pray that you would even just, God, speak to them through dreams and visions. And God, just in these next, just stir in them. And God, over this next season of time, this next month, God, I pray you would sharpen that. We ask it in your name, in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm sorry. I went long.